Dr. Cynthia Pillai is an associate professor of neuro neurology and ophthalmology at, here at NYU, Grossman School of Medicine, and a clinical neuro-ophthalmologist at NYU Langone Health. She has a long-standing background in vision research that started in the laboratory of Torsten N. Weissel, Nobel laureate, and more recently in head injury at the NYU Concussion Center. Her main passion is interacting with patients and families and offering care on an individualized basis. And following Dr. Pillai's presentation, we'll have uh, Dr. Nidhi Agarwal, um, who is a cl clinical assistant professor of endocrinology at NYU Grossman School of Medicine and director of pituitary diseases at NYU Langone Health. She specializes in treating endocrine system disorders, many of which are often experienced by those who had clival tumors, um, such as adrenal insufficiency, hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, and pituitary disorders. So we'll turn it over to Dr. Pillai, and then move on to Dr. Agarwal, and then we'll do some Q&A. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to join you today. Um, so one of the questions I'll be answering today is what exactly is neuro-ophthalmology? It's an uncommon specialty. Uh, so in terms of vision, when we think about clinically, what do we need for vision? You need the eye. Um, this is an oversimplified uh, representation, the optic nerve that connects the vision data from the eye to the vision pathways and processing in the brain. So we need the eyes to work, the muscles of the eyes, which control movement um, and are responsible for giving you single vision as opposed to double vision when they uh, malfunction, the optic nerve, the vision pathways in the brain, and the balance system. So what the hell is neuro-ophthalmology? So most people know what an ophthalmologist is. An ophthalmologist takes care of your eyeballs. And so I like to pride myself that uh, my two kids, who are six and seven, are probably the only two children in New York City, uh, maybe in the country, who actually know what a neuro-ophthalmologist is. Um, and so what they'll tell you is that neuro-ophthalmologists handle the back end of the system. So your ophthalmologist has your eyeball, and we handle the vision nerves, muscles of the eye, the brain's vision pathways, and, and processing in the brain. So what do you need for vision? So here on the left is a, a picture of the, the eye. The contents of the eye, you can see um, that uh, the lens is pointed out, the cornea is pointed out, the retina, where people might have macular degeneration, um, the you know, impact of glaucoma, cataracts, that's all inside the eyeball. That's all for your ophthalmologist. And you can see here, there are a couple muscles in the photo, the superior rectus muscle, the inferior rectus muscle. That, that starts becoming neuro-ophthalmology territory when that malfunctions, as well as the optic nerve that connects to the back of the eye. And in the picture on the right is an MRI. Many of you, I'm sure, ha are, have had MRIs. Um, I have myself. The red and yellow diagrammed, uh, pa that, that represents where the vision data travels in the brain. So vision and balance. So when we walk around or we play tennis or, or you know, even navigate a New York City sidewalk, which may be harder than tennis in some cases, um, so you need good vision from each eye to be aligned to get depth perception. This information feeds to other parts of the body. It feeds to the brain so it knows what the world around you is like. And instantaneously, it wants to keep you in balance as you step over the bump in the sidewalk or hit that backhand. And it sends data about the position of your body, how your body needs to move to react so that you maintain balance and not fall over. So when you come to a neuro-ophthalmology appointment, it's helpful if you bring your glasses distance glasses, near glasses, sunglasses, whatever you use frequently. I also recommend bringing MRIs on CD if you had care outside of NYU. Everything within the NYU system we can e all easily access. This allows us to look at the pictures of your, your imaging. Uh, the reports often tell you what, what happens, but 
um, as they say, picture is worth a thousand words. And, and the physician, you know, like myself, looking at that picture with you gives a better assessment of what's going on and how we can help you. We also um, review your visit notes from whatever providers led you to us. Bring any list of questions you have. Um, a companion is always welcome. I know things were different during peak COVID, but now you are welcome to bring a companion. Sometimes we also dilate your eyes, similar to what your eye doctor does, which gives you blurry vision for four to six hours. Sometimes patients who have a tendency for migraines, the vision testing we do can trigger a headache. Um, bring a little Excedrin, bring your sunglasses. They can help with the brightness after dilation and a plan to get home. You might not feel up to driving home after the appointment just because of the vision and the, and the dilation. So this is actually a photo of my examination room. Um, you know, you come in, there's all of us doctors are now bound by computers and clicking things. So there's always a computer in the room, um, the slit lamp machine, which is what we'll use to look in your eyes. We check vision at distance and near. We check your color vision, the reflex of your pupils. This all gives us information about the health of the optic nerve. We look at the appearance of the optic nerve, and we also assess the way your eyes move independently and together. And that's where symptoms like double vision can come into play. Double vision impairs what we call stereoacuity, which is depth perception. So um, if you have double vision, it's hard to navigate distance in space, stairs, the hallway, uh, reaching for your coffee cup. And also we do a full neurologic examination in case there are other findings that involve the cranial nerves that travel in the head. That can be facial sensation, facial movement, um, you know, so, so we'll examine your, your body as well from a neurologic standpoint. We also employ testing in the office we do something called a visual field test. Some of you may have had it done. Um, it's kind of where you look in a big bowl and lights flash around you and you click a button when you see a light flash. That's a, that's a test involved in assessment of peripheral vision, which is also important for driving. We use a machine called an OCT for short, optical coherence tomography, because in medicine you cannot have a simple name for anything. So this test assesses the health of the optic nerve. So we can give you a sense of if your optic nerve is being impacted and um, what we would recommend for that. So symptomatic management. So if a patient has, for example, double vision, we employ a variety of techniques to help with the, dub with the double vision. So, um, the middle picture on the top, that's called lens blurring. So you guys know scotch tape. There's like scotch tape that's totally clear and scotch tape that's kind of occluded. It's a little blurry whitish. So I'm sure, well, it's, it's true, but all the medical assistants in our department think I'm kind of a little crazy. They think we're all a little crazy, but I'm particularly a little crazy because I have to have blurry scotch tape in my office because as a neuro-ophthalmologist, it's hard to practice without it because it is the easiest and cheapest way to manage double vision. You essentially put two layers of that blurry tape over one lens of the glasses and you've solved your double vision problem from a symptomatic standpoint. So if it bothers you at a time, let's say in the evening when you sit down to read and you're tired, you get double vision, but you just wanna keep reading that good book, have some of that blurry scotch tape you blur one lens, it'll give you single vision to complete the task that you're in the middle of. Another option is to put a completely black cover over one lens or wear an eye patch. I find a lot of my patients aren't so keen on that because it blocks the light peripherally. And whereas when you use just the blur, you still kind of have that peripheral input, which, you know, New York City, if you live here crossing the streets, that's a difference between life and death. Uh, but you know, people do, it does help. This is a photo of uh, Hillary Clinton from some time ago, and it was in all over like the New York Post and other newspapers, because if you look in the left lens of her eyeglasses, 
There is grading. There's vertical lines that are visible. She is wearing a Fresnel prism. This is a stick-on prism that we supply in the office. Um, depending on the significance of the double vision and how misaligned the eyes are, this is something that can help give you single vision again with some depth perception. So it's not applicable to every situation, but it's a pretty um, easy fix. We cut them down and stick them on right in the office. Uh, you know, it's, it's not like buying a new pair of glasses. It's great to temporarily address as some, pe some patients have double vision and the alignment is not always the same. Sometimes it's this, as things recover over a period of weeks or months, the, al the alignment could get closer together, it could shift angle, and Fresnel prisms allow for temporary quick changes. Uh, in terms of vision therapy, vision therapy does not improve the alignment of eyes in the cases of where there's an injury to the nerve. So vision therapy, as we use it in these cases, is really for adaptation. Um, how to adapt to different activities, how to adapt to the stick on prism or the blurring of one lens. Um, the data behind vision therapy and what it actually helps for is, is only for one specific type of misalignment that's usually not seen in, in the cases of chordoma or other intracranial lesions. Uh, so, so in my opinion, that, that can assist, but it has limited, limited utility. Then um, surgical management. So as a patient recovers, or is in the recovery process from chordoma, if the double vision remains present, uh, there are surgical procedures that can be done to realign the eyes. This is an outpatient day procedure, most commonly done in kids, if you've heard of kids with a lazy eye. Um, so so it's, uh, it's, they don't cut your eyelids, they don't take your eyeballs out of your head, nothing um, quite that dramatic. It's a, it's a relatively simple procedure as far as surgeries go. And that's kind of in, once we know the eyes have stabilized, that, that becomes an option. Um, and your neuro-ophthalmologist can help guide you through that, through that path. So the, the state of New York and in most states, it is illegal to drive with double vision, but it is legal to drive with one eyeball. So, you know, that may explain a lot or, in some cases, you know, but I, I, wanna, I wanna talk to you about that, driving with one eyeball. So let's say you, you have double vision, you live a lifestyle where you have to drive in a car every day, you have to survive, you know, you still wanna drop somebody off somewhere, you still wanna get groceries. It's, it's possible based on comfort level and based on how good the other eye is. So if you look at these two pictures on the left, the top one is somebody with two, uh, I'm sorry, to your right. Uh, the top one is somebody with two normal eyes with a full visual field. The bottom is a picture of somebody with one normal eye. So what they really lose is a little bit of the visual field on the left. And that's something that you can adapt to. Uh, there are places that do driving rehab um, and many patients can adapt to driving with one eye closed. The DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles, also allows for a variety of restrictions. So for example, you could be allowed to drive during daylight hours on your usual route that you're familiar with. There are, there are all sorts of uh, categories that we can assist people in terms of being able to drive to continue your lifestyle as you wish and as you need. Um, but again, all of this is, in, is done with the guidance of a neuro-ophthalmologist to make sure you're safe. So neuro-ophthalmology, how do you find us? So our national organization um, is called NANOS. Uh, the website is nanosweb.org. And if you click on the Patients tab, under that it says find a neuro-ophthalmologist and you can search by country or state. So, for example, there are entire countries without neuro-ophthalmologists. I'm, I'm also a board-certified neurologist, and when I go to our neurology annual meeting the, for, the, for the U.S., there's like over 30,000 attendees. 
and our neuro-ophthalmology conference, there's 700, and that's including international. So we kind of um, all know each other and have, you know, sort of prying insights into each other's personal lives. We're just a small, tight-knit, uh, slightly quirky group. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so depending on where you live, we very well may know the neuro-ophthalmologist in your area, but you don't have to have a neuro-ophthalmologist near your home. So, for example, if you were to establish care here at the center, you know, um, I would see you in the office or one of my colleagues, and it's very likely that you would have in your area an optometrist optometrists are trained in looking at extraocular movements and eye movements, more so than many general ophthalmologists. General ophthalmologists often focus on surgery, um, as well as pediatric eye doctors and strabismus specialists sometimes also see adult patients because they're the lazy eye doctors and they look at eye movements. And so if you can't find a neuro-ophthalmologist locally, we can communicate with the type of provider you do have access to for monitoring in between follow-ups in, in the New York office. Um, so it's something that, especially now with uh, patient apps such as MyChart, where you can you know, message your medical team and review everything and share records with your other doctors in person, um, it, can, it can really ease the stress of having to coordinate that on top of everything else you're doing. Um, to coordinate your care. So my uh, department, there are, there are six of us. We're one of the largest groups in the world. Um, and all of my colleagues are, are thorough and kind and interested. Um, and your, your surgeons and your other team members know how to reach us. And um, we would welcome the opportunity to help in, in any way we can. Um, I know as a physician, uh, what it's like to watch patients going through a hard time. I also know as a patient myself what it's like to go through a hard time or see a family member go through a hard time. And um, we want to be a support system for you guys through, through this process. So um, I'll be happy to take any questions you have um, after the wonderful uh, Dr. Agarwal speaks with you now. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. It's really, really, really a pleasure um, to, to be here today. Thank you to Shannon. Thank you to Dr. Sen for inviting me. Um, I've actually never attended a conference like this, so it's honestly a pleasure to be in this wonderful conference room today. Um, thank you, Cynthia. That was excellent, as always. Uh, you know, for those of you who don't know, by the way, Cynthia also teaches our medical students, the residents, fellows, and she's always always a hit and you know always a, a wonderful speech um, every time she she gives us gives us one so um i am the director of pituitary diseases here at nyu um so that's kind of the gland that i'm going to focus on and i'm also going to talk to you about why it's relevant um you know for chordomas so for those of you who don't know, pituitary is a tiny, very, very small kind of a pea-sized structure. I always tell my patients it's present right at the intersection of my fingers, so just behind the nose. It's at the skull base, you know, which is why it's very relevant when we talk about clivor tumors. Um, and you know, when we talk about neuroendocrinology, um, we are talking about a connection between the nervous system and the pituitary gland, which is the endocrine gland. Um, so neuroendocrinology basically means nerve signals from the brain which are directing your pituitary and telling it what to do, which is essentially to make hormones. What are hormones? Hormones are chemicals which coordinate different functions in your body. I'm sure everyone here has heard about the thyroid hormones, sex hormones, growth hormones, so all of that really comes from the pituitary gland. One of the major problems with, um, or it could be with uh, radiation-induced uh, hypopituitarism, which is what we see in chordomas, um, is that there could be a deficiency of all these hormones that the pituitary gland makes. So you might be very familiar with this schematic now since we're coming to the end of the chordoma day, but um, just to, let me see if my cursor works, yeah. So that is the clivus where the chordoma you know, you heard this morning approximately 40% of all skull-based tumors could be in the clival area. Um, so it could be really right there. 
and then sitting right above that is the pituitary gland. So I've marked it here. Um, so very, very close proximity, but um, you, you know, you can see here any kind of intervention along the clival area, any radiation to the clivus can absolutely affect this very important gland. So um, I'm not going to go over every uh, point here, but just to kind of let you know, low pituitary hormones or hormone deficiency doesn't just come from radiation, but there are lots and lots of different causes. So I deal with the pituitary gland, so lots of my patients actually have tumors inside the pituitary itself, which doesn't let it, let it function as well. But in the, in the context of chordomas, radiation treatment, you know, whether it's uh, stereotactic radiation, proton beam, uh, of course the risk is pretty low, but that can destroy the pituitary gland tissue and hence lead to um, hypopituitarism. The direct damage um, is really at the level of the hypothalamus. So hypothalamus is the higher center right above the pituitary, which sends all the signals to the pituitary gland, asking it to make hormones. So anytime we talk about radiation in that area, it's really kind of the local deficit around the hypothalamus and the pituitary, and both those organs get affected for you to develop hypopituitarism. So medically, we call it the hypothalamic pituitary tract, but you know, just think about it as any cells which are helping you make hormones, when they get damaged, they will give you hormone deficiencies. Um, so in terms of the risk, it's approximately 30% following gamma knife. I'm sure you, everyone heard Dr. Konzioka's lecture today. Um, he spoke about how the smaller tumor volume, you know, depending on the intensity of radiation, how long you've had the disease, um, the age of diagnosis, and so on. But the approximate risk of developing <coughs> hormone deficiencies is approximately 20 to 30 percent. And it can be a little bit higher, closer to 30 to 50 percent, if you're talking about proton beam therapy. This is a schematic of kind of what happens at the level of the hypothalamus and all the signals that are sent. So again, hypothalamus is, you know, just think about it as right above the pituitary, kind of the main director of this master gland. Um, and hypothalamus is the area which, was, which is gonna send all the signals, as you can see with these arrows. So those are the arrows, so it's sending all the signals to the anterior pituitary. So the pituitary gland has an anterior portion, which is the larger portion, and a smaller posterior portion. But 80% of the gland is the anterior pituitary, and that's kind of what makes all the important hormones. So as soon as these signals come through from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary, there are a bunch of hormones that are produced. So I'm not going to go over details, but you can see it says GH, which is growth hormone. LH and FSH are sex hormones, so they help you make testosterone in a male and estrogen in a female. ACTH is the main regulator of a very important hormone called cortisol that comes from the adrenal glands. TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone, so it tells your thyroid to make thyroid hormone. And prolactin, or PRL as it says in that diagram, prolactin is a hormone of pregnancy and lactation. So anytime you're pregnant, anytime you're breastfeeding, that's the hormone that helps you do so. So all of these are hormones that come from the pituitary and then they go into the target glands and they help them with its function. When we talk about hormone deficiency, and you know, this is something that always comes up in medical school teaching, in resident teaching, but you know, I think it's a very important concept. Um, just by a show of hands, is anyone here on hormones, you know, steroids, thyroid? Thank you, thank you. Yeah, so you know, this is something that we don't quite understand, but as I was saying before, the pituitary makes a whole array of hormones. For some reason, the first hormone that is almost always affected in adults is growth hormone. Now, you know, again, it could be because somatotrophs or the, the kind of the growth hormone making cells are abundant in the pituitary, so they're just more likely to damage. That's just, uh, you know, one of the hypotheses that has been suggested. But it is known that growth hormone is the first hormone to start becoming deficient. The second one is the sex hormones, FSH and LH. The third one is the TSH. And then thankfully, the last one is the hormone that is probably the most important, which is ACTH, which helps your adrenals make steroid. So ACTH is um, you know, extremely important. It's vital for life. No one can live without ACTH because you need cortisol for daily function. I always tell the medical students to remember it just in the way it appears. So growth hormone, just two letters, 
growth hormone is the first one, FSH, LH, so F comes before T, so FSH, LH is the second one, TSH is the, is the third one, and then the longest acronym, ACTH, is the last one, and it almost always works that way. But in terms of importance, I would take it the opposite way. So again, ACTH is probably the most important hormone that your pituitary makes, helps your adrenals make cortisol, which is extremely, extremely vital for life. So how do we check patients for uh, hypopituitarism? So I'll just start by saying, I have patients who have developed this unfortunate, uh, unfortunate disease um, up to five to 10 years after radiation as well. So we really have to develop a relationship. I see these patients almost every six months to annually, just to make sure that we're checking all these pituitary hormones very regularly. So just because you have one set of normal hormones doesn't quite rule out that you would not get this deficiency in the future. Um, we almost always do morning blood tests. So I've put in the inset here, this, this picture, which shows you that almost all hormones, including cortisol, which is the most vital hormone, like we said, all these hormones, they start peaking in the morning. So even if you're a late riser, approximately one to two hours after you wake up is when you're really going to see your peak cortisol. That's the hormone that lets you function through the day. And then as you can see in that diagram, towards the afternoon, so 12 to 3 p.m. or so, there is this small lull, and then again, you know, it starts coming up in the middle of the night, and then it peaks up kind of in the early mornings, uh, in the early morning hours. So that's the reason your endocrinologist or your physician might always ask you to do a cortisol early morning, and it's really important to do it that way so you can interpret the results. Thyroid hormone levels, so those really could be done any time of the day. We also like to do a testosterone for men just to check their sex hormone uh, production from the pituitary and hence the testosterone production from testicles. And this is again a dynal variation. So we like to do this in the morning time between nine and 11. Uh, we almost always request our patients to come in fasting because meals can make your testosterone artificially low. Um, so again, this is one where it has to be fasting early morning. IGF-1 is a surrogate of growth hormone. Um, and that's, again, it, you know, it reflects your growth hormone uh, production. It's not a great screening test, but we check it anyway. And then, of course, we check other hormones like LH, FSH, and prolactin. So this is the panel that all my post-radiation patients will get at least every year, sometimes every six months to a year, depending on what we see clinically. I'm going to quickly and very briefly go over different deficiencies. Please feel free to interrupt me. You know, if you, I would really love for this to be interactive or any questions or if there's any detail that I didn't go over. So the first one I'm going to start with is ACTH deficiency. And again, just to remind you, that's the last hormone that is usually deficient with hypopituitarism, but probably the most important. And you know, as you can see here, the symptoms can really be very nonspecific. So fatigue, dizziness, it can give you nausea, vomiting, you know, diarrhea. So sometimes, you know, I have patients who just haven't had a good sleep and they could have, you know, symptoms which are very, very similar. So the suspicion has to be high. We have to screen for this disorder because this is not something we ever want to miss. Um, there are many tests that we can do to diagnose adrenal insufficiency, which comes to at the level of the pituitary. One is, of course, the morning cortisol, which really has to be done early morning. But then this is a special test that almost any endocrinologist is going to offer in their office. It's called an ACTH stimulation test. So again, not to confuse anyone, but this is where we give you the molecule that you're missing, which is ACTH, and then we check and see if you're truly responding in the way that you should. So the cortisol levels have to come up after you get this particular test, um, and we look for a goal level of approximately 14 to 15. The advantages with this test is that it's a very controlled setting. You have to do it in a doctor's office, and you can do it any time of the day. You do not need to be fasting. You don't need to do it in the morning. You literally can do it um, you know, even in the late afternoon hours. So it does improve flexibility, but it's usually the second test after we do the morning cortisol. Um, it looks like some of you are indeed on hormones, so you may be familiar with a steroid called hydrocortisone. Um, so hydrocortisone is probably the most commonly prescribed steroid here in the United States. We mostly use it because it's physiological, so it tends to mimic what the body is trying to do. So even in a normal person, I'm just gonna go back. Um, as you saw here, there's a dynal variation on the cortisol, so it peaks in the morning, comes down in the afternoon, so we are trying to mimic that, which is why the way we treat it is with a higher dose of hydrocortisone in the morning, approximately 10 to 15 milligrams, and then a smaller dose in the afternoon. 
We talk about sick day rules. So, you know, whoever's on steroid in this room would know this. Anytime you're not feeling well, you have to double the dose of steroids because steroids suppress your immunity. We, I am very, very particular about making sure that all my patients have what's called stress dose and emergency steroid vials at home. It's called Actovire. That's what you're seeing here in this inset. So basically, anytime the patients feel like they cannot tolerate something orally or they're throwing up the pills, they have to inject that to make sure they don't go into adrenal crisis. All my patients know that they have to wear a medical alert bracelet or something on their body that alerts the physicians or any bystander that they have um, steroid deficiency. And vaccinations almost always have to be up to date um, with uh, chronic steroid deficiency. Um, this is again, you know, just to quickly tell you that there are different steroids and this is how we look, we look at those equivalents for different steroids. DSH deficiency, which is thyroid hormone deficiency. So again, very similar symptoms to ACTH deficiency. So fatigue, mental depression, feeling cold, weight gain sometimes. Um, and this one is much easier to replace because it's usually just a once a day medication called levothyroxine. I'm sure many of you are familiar with levothyroxine. Uh, you know, there was a recent study which said that it's probably the number one prescribed drug in the United States now. So very, very commonly used. Sometimes people use it for the thyroid gland not working. Sometimes they use it when the pituitary is not working. So in this case, it's the pituitary not working, not making enough DSH, and hence you get hypothyroid. Um, so the treatment for this is levothyroxine, a very easy to take early morning medication. Sex hormone deficiency, so it depends on whether it's a male or a female, uh, but you know, women can sometimes present with irregular menstrual cycles, infertility, men can come in with uh, impotence and decreased libido, um, and the way we diagnose it is with blood tests, so estrogen levels, testosterone levels, and again, those usually have to be done in the morning. There is a whole slew of medications that we can use for patients who are deficient in these hormones. This is this is probably just like half fit, you know, because it's such a huge industry, uh, testosterone replacement therapy. But um, lots of different options. There are creams, there are injectables, there are patches of testosterone in different ways. Uh, and similarly, for women who are deficient, we can use estrogen and progesterone. So the last one that I'm going to just briefly touch on is growth hormone. Now, of course, you know, adults are not growing, so this is not for, for gaining height, but growth hormone deficiency is still extremely, extremely important to treat even in adults. So what are the main symptoms of adults with growth hormone deficiency? It can lead to weight gain. That's probably the number one thing I want to highlight, and that weight gain is usually along the midriff. It can also give you high lipids, it can give you fatigue, trouble sleeping. So almost always growth hormone levels in a normal person peak at night. So if you do not have enough growth hormone, so that's why we say you know kids should sleep because their growth hormone levels really peak at night and that's when they grow. So if you don't have enough growth hormone levels, uh, you might have a very, very disrupted sleep pattern. So it absolutely makes a difference. But the main problem with growth hormone replacement is that it's growth hormone. So it's an anabolic, it's a proactive or a proliferative factor, which can basically grow tumors that you already have. So for chordomas specifically, unfortunately, there are no studies which look at chordomas and growth hormone replacement. There are studies done on other tumors in the brain. There are studies done on pituitary adenomas. So we can extrapolate the data and think that growth hormone is almost always pretty safe. I will say though, in my practice, I have never used it in chordomas because it makes me very nervous about early recurrence. Anytime you do have growth hormone therapy on board, if you are you know, a chordoma survivor and if you're using it, you have to be very, very sure that the levels are checked every two to three months. That's how frequently they should be. Um, again, you know, just with a quick show of hands, anyone who's on growth hormone therapy? Yeah, so it's extremely, extremely controversial, but you know, it is something that's, that's really coming into the limelight just because it is one of the first hormones that becomes deficient. So just to quickly conclude, uh, you know, radiation-induced uh, anterior pituitary hormone deficiencies unfortunately are irreversible. If anyone is on these hormones, you would know that they have to be on for the rest of your life. Uh, but it does become a way of life, and there are, you know, we can absolutely work with you very closely to make sure that you're feeling your best on these hormones. Um, it's very important to get these regular tests done baseline pituitary hormone assessment. So even if you've had normal pituitary function with a history of radiation, we really urge you to get checked every six months to a year. Um, and then the most important one really to not miss is ACTH deficiency, which is that last hormone we spoke about, just because it could be life-threatening. 
So any questions, I am around and very happy to answer. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you both. Um, if you give us a second, we're going to bring some chairs in for the two speakers so we can do a little Q&A. Um, so sit tight. We'll be right All right. It's very informal. Any questions? Yeah. Here. <laughs> your, yeah, oh, your pituitary presentation is me. I mean, with the exception of the growth hormone, um, I have a adrenal insufficiency, arm, uh, wrist, on my wrist. Um, I had proton a couple years later affected. I'm on hydrocortisone, 10 in the morning, 5 in the afternoon, level thyroxine, and uh, testosterone. And um, it's all been manageable. Um, nothing, no crazy side effects or anything like that. Um, so I just wanted to point out that you yeah. can, if you wind up in that situation, it is manageable. Yeah, no, thank you so much for that comment. So yeah, no, and thank you for sharing that. So, you know, I have patients who've been on these hormones for years and years, and like you said, as long as we monitor those, make sure that you don't get any side effects. So I just wanted to quickly mention, since you brought it up, so steroids have to be really watched carefully. If you overdose on steroids or if you're taking too much, even if it's just a five milligram difference on the hydrocortisone that you're taking, you, you could potentially go into hyperglycemia, high cholesterol, and one of the main things is really bone loss or osteoporosis. So I hope you know someone's checking on that. Yeah, every year or two again. Excellent, yeah. So that's, yeah, so that's one of the big ones with steroids. Thyroid, is the, you know, the free T4 is the main way to, to monitor, as you, as you know. Um, and again, we really have to make sure that you stay on the upper end of normal. So 1.5, 1.6 is where we like it to be. Um, testosterone, kind of the goal is between 400 to 700 to keep your testosterone around that level. Um, and then growth hormone, you know, I'm actually quite happy that you're not taking growth hormone because it's still quite controversial. Until we have a little more data, I would feel I would just not be comfortable prescribing it yet. Um, I, I am very happy to hear that you're not getting side effects because again, you know, we are getting you from almost zero to normal. We're not over treating you because that's when most of those side effects come on. But yeah, thank you. So I'm presently getting uh, at the Mass General uh, proton beam therapy for a clavicodoma and the codoma was actually pushed. It was in the cella tersica and pushed the pituitary uh, now it's gone, the pituitary's back in the right area, and the radiation is hitting it definitively. I've heard from some people that it, it's not if, um, it's not like a when thing, it's gonna come in three or five, it's, it's 100%, I'm going to have pituitary dysfunction. Um, uh, do you hear, I mean, do you see that? It's, it's, all, it's, a, it's a definitive, definite thing? So, so, the, so the data is 30 to 50 percent, but I can tell you if it was a larger tumor and if it was pushing into the pituitary gland, unfortunately, just because of the way it's radiated, you know, which is the main field of radiation, it's probably affected. I mean, it's hard to know, you know, without knowing all the details, but I would say it's very likely. Um, yeah, for, so, so again, in that situation, we really have to make sure that we're checking all your hormones at least every six months. Um, yeah, and those would have to be morning kind of baseline pituitary function to make sure that that's not affected in any way. Um, I just to reassure you, it, it sounds like a lot to go from zero medications to you know four different hormones, uh, which we really don't know much. It about. does, yeah. But it it really ultimately your your body just gets so used to that new baseline, which improves your quality of life. Because you know sometimes I have patients where I say. I'm okay with you stopping the other hormones, so not the steroids, of course, because that's life-threatening, but they can hold off on their thyroid, they can hold off on their testosterone, they hold off on their growth hormone, and we mostly do it as an exercise to see kind of what they feel like, you know, what their quality of life is, how they feel at baseline. And I can assure you, almost always in a week, I have patients who just want to go back on all these hormones again. It's it is a lot, but it absolutely is to get you back to your baseline. You're only replacing what you're missing from the pituitary. We're not over-treating you with these hormones. We're just giving you back what you're missing. Um, 
I, I will say that you know there are newer treatments and newer clinical trials where we're looking at say once weekly or you know one or once in two weeks of a growth hormone injection as opposed to a daily injection that we're doing right now. So there are lots of ways of improving those hormone um, replacement therapies, but to not take it at all would be, yeah, would probably not be the best. Right. So you're a neuro endocrinologist. I know in my area we have endocrinologists. Um, <laughs> do you, you need to see a neuroendocrinologist? So I, if and you if you have one, yes, that that would be great. But you know, I will say, as opposed to Dr. Pillai, who is specifically trained in neuroophthalmology, we don't have a specific kind of a training program for for neuroendocrinology. So essentially, I did my internal medicine residency. I did endocrinology, right. and after that, I dedicated six or seven years of my practice only to pituitary tumors. So it's it's kind of a practice thing. You know, it's you're just doing more of it. All my research, all my clinical trials, everything is in pituitary tumors. So it's not a specific training per se. Say. But if you have someone who does more pituitary you know, than other endocrinology disorders, I think that's the person you would want to see. There's also no good way to look for neuroendocrinologists as opposed to what Dr. Pillai shared with us. You know, we really don't have a website like that. Um, but I can tell you there are at least three or four in Manhattan you know, who are amazing and they have pituitary centers okay. in the city. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. F on that question, is it, I think, an academic medical center would be like a, a good place to start typically or generally speaking is that do you agree that absolutely yeah okay. yeah so the larger centers in, in new york exactly and for both of you do you because i think that goes for neuro ophthalmology too is looking at academic medical centers to find someone specialized in neuro ophthalmology and if it's really just not possible for patients in their local areas to find those particular specialties um things we've heard before is that wherever patients were treated at the larger centers, if there is a neuro-ophthalmologist or neuroendocrinologist there, they could visit with that, uh, that doctor when they go for follow-ups, things like that, and then when they go home, find uh, an endocrinologist or the one they already have that you guys could kind of collaborate or consult with local doctors. Is that something that... Definitely. So... Okay. As a neural ophthalmologist and just being an uncommon specialty in general, not, you know, uh, my comment is not specific to, to Cordoma. We have patients come from Ohio or, you know, uh, the Midwest, um, from all sorts of locations internationally as well, just because we're an uncommon specialty. Uh, so correspondence with a, a, a local provider is something we frequently do, uh, and we make it work. Um, so, so I think uh, you know, if if there's uh, for neuro ophthalmology anyway, there are optometrists, there are pediatric ophthalmologists, there there are people and specialties that are more widespread than mine, and we we work with them frequently. So that's that that's something that we can work around for sure. I had a doctor question for Dr. Pillai, if I may ask. Sure. I've asked this question a couple of times to my doctors, and maybe you would have an answer. I finished a month ago 42 sessions of proton uh, radiation, mm -hmm. and I seem to have constantly on my left eye, it's tearing. And I do nasal rinses, and it was suggested that maybe it's the water from the nasal rinses. But as an experiment, I didn't do nasal rinses to see if it was still tearing. And out of the blue, it starts tearing profusely, and I don't know why. Have you heard if this is related to the radiation, or could it be the surgery, or why is it happening? So in terms of tearing, um, that would be front end of the system. So have you seen somebody in cornea to take a look at your lacrimal gland? Uh, no, I'm making an appointment. I just finished yeah. with this. I'm making yeah, yeah. an appointment with uh, an ophthalmologist in yeah. Chicago. Yeah, so I think you should have your um, lacrimal duct examined. Mm -hmm. In terms of the tear film, maintaining the tear film on the eye so that you don't get tears is really a function of the lower lid and the lacrimal duct. Um, sometimes patients need uh, punctal plugs or different things. So I would, I would see an ophthalmologist who's familiar with lid issues. Um, 
to, to give an opinion on that. I was planning anyway, but I was Good. wondering if you had heard of something. Good. Like that. Yeah. Um, so we have uh, we have patients develop uh, difficulty, you know, problems with tearing um, from from radiation, depending on where the where the angle is, and I usually refer those patients to our ophthalmology team. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Um, I think you indicated uh, in, from the endocrinological standpoint that, say, 30 to 50 percent of patients who have had proton beam radiation will develop some form of pituitary deterioration or issue. Are there markers or indicators that you've identified that could help one refine what group of people fall into that 30 to 50 percent as opposed to those people who have proton beam and then do not have any pituitary issues thereafter? What separates yeah. one group from the other? Thank you. You know, that's, that's a great question. So most of that data that I shared with you, those, that has been extrapolated from pituitary adenoma radiation. We don't really have direct, you know, kind of data on chordomas and radiation. So everything that I shared with you was on pituitary adenomas, but it's absolutely relevant here as well. So it's not just the clival chordomas, but just as an example, nasopharyngeal cancers, which are also in that same vicinity, radiation to that area can also give you hypopituitarism. Um, so to answer your question, yeah, so what we do know is the size of the tumor, the proximity to the pituitary gland. There was actually a nice paper that spoke about a 15 millimeter distance. So anytime um, the field of radiation and the pituitary are within 15 millimeters, you may potentially kind of be risking hypopituitarism. So that's, again, something to think about. Um, and then, of course, if it's re-radiation or if it's a recurrence or you're getting radiation again, then that increases your risk of, uh, of getting hypopituitarism. Um, it, it, it's a great question. We don't quite have the exact markers or, you know, there's really no way to know exactly which patient will, will develop it, but we keep a very, very close watch with those risk factors in mind. And as long as I have the mic, another question for our neuro-ophthalmologist. Um, my clival chordoma uh, grew over my sixth cranial nerve and caused uh, a lack of motion in my left eye. My neurosurgeons were quite pessimistic, saying that, you know, we think we've got a very good shot at a good resection of your chordoma, but we are really not very optimistic that the chordoma has not permanently damaged your sixth cranial nerve. And then yet, as soon as the operation, the, the resection surgery was over, my eye regained its movement. I mean, we were absolutely, they were all flabbergasted that this had happened, that I had that favorable an outcome. Is, is that, uh, how typical is it, if you will, for a chordoma to cause permanent nerve damage in, say, the cranial nerves? So I think with, um, you know, in terms of studies and data specific to chordoma patients, the volume of data is not there to extrapolate. That being said, there are other growths that can injure the sixth cranial nerve, meningiomas and other lesions. The sixth cranial nerve is also prone to injury by blood sugar. Um, patients with diabetes can have it. Patients with high blood pressure can have it. Um, it. It bounces back more reliably in the setting of a, a diabetes-related sixth cranial nerve. Uh, so it really depends on what's left of the structure of the nerve. Um, so it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tough sort of guess. Um, so, but what I can say is, in terms of strategies to, to manage a sixth cranial nerve injury, we have them. So even if the nerve does not recover, we can formulate a game plan to help movement of the eye and if a patient has double vision to help those symptoms. So. You know, it's, it's hard not to worry about your sixth cranial nerve and if it's going to bounce back, but that's one of the nerves we can work around. The optic nerve, on the other hand, um, is the one that's carrying your vision data. So, so that 
we, we currently, in terms of development and technology, don't have a workaround for that nerve. So, so different nerves uh, sort of, we can, we can manage symptoms, and other nerves are harder to manage symptoms with. Um, one of the other things that I didn't mention, uh, I think, in my slides is that chordoma patients and a variety of patients with intracranial lesions can develop pain, uh, facial pain, um, pain around the scar. Uh, those are things that um, I, I treat in the office with what's called trigger point injections or nerve blocks. Um, it hurts less than getting your blood drawn. Uh, it's a very small cosmetic grade needle and um, we, we essentially inject uh, a mix of lidocaine and bupivacaine um, to help numb the area. It usually gives good benefit for anywhere from four to six weeks. It's a procedure that's covered by insurance. Um, it's repeatable every four weeks. It doesn't mix with drugs in your body. It doesn't, you know, get systemic through your body. So we have uh, ways to manage manage pain that's triggered uh, by lesions as well. You said that was for general neuralgia. For any head neuralgia, so I do um, uh, trigger point and nerve blocks for any type of head head neuralgia. So it could be somebody who has had brain surgery and the scar, they have residual scar pain. Um, trigeminal neuralgia, in, in particular, is is a common type of neuralgia we inject for. Hi. Yes, this is a question for you, Dr. Pillai. Um, you spoke earlier about uh, putting scotch tape on um, yes. glasses for yes. double vision. I had never heard of that before. Um, can you speak about how does that work? What's the science behind it? And sure. also, like, um, is there a similar thing for people that don't have glasses? <laughs> So, okay, so in terms of vision, so to have double vision, you need vision coming from two eyes, okay? It's, there, there are forms of double vision that can happen in one eye due to ophthalmic conditions, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about somebody with visual input from the right eye, visual input from the left eye. And what the brain is looking for is those two to be perfectly matched together, as if my palms were together, okay? And that data then allows the brain to assess depth perception. So if you have a sixth cranial nerve palsy and your right eye is not moving properly, and therefore your brain's getting an image from the left eye that is not matching up with the image from the right eye, and that's giving it double vision. The double scotch tape is enough of a blur to make your brain ignore the eye that's not seeing as well. So sometimes people are born with an asymmetry in vision. One eye doesn't see as well as the other eye, commonly with the term lazy eye. The brain starts to ignore the eye with the blurry vision thereby focusing only on the eye with the clear vision. So the right eye with the six nerve palsy is if you put the two layers of scotch tape over the lens of that eye, your brain will start to ignore that second image and you will only see one image. It's essentially tricking your brain. If you do not use glasses, um, you know, when I was a kid, it was like, you know, I needed glasses from when I was in, I don't know, fifth grade or something, and you just didn't want to be the kid with, with glasses. But now glasses are fashionable, and you can buy them at H&M and all sorts of places, and there's no damn prescription in them. People just wear them <laughs> to look smarter at interviews or whatever else. And so, you know, you pick up a pair of those from H&M for $5.99, bring them to your optometrist or your neuro-ophthalmologist's office, and they'll put the scotch tape on that lens. Or you just go from H&M to CVS, pick up your blurry scotch tape, and you're good to go. <laughs> if you have prescription sunglasses, you can also just apply two layers of the blurry tape to the eye that is not behaving well. The other thing on that point is people think, oh, if I'm covering that right eye for weeks and weeks and weeks, 
isn't it going to stop it from getting better? It will not. So um, in sort of vision processing studies, we see that, uh, you know, some would debate whether these are appropriate studies, but for example, in, in primates, in development, if you block one eye, so even children born with cataracts in an eye, that vision pathway from that eye does not develop properly. But once you hit the age of seven and you've been looking with both eyes, those pathways are pretty set. So you can wear the patch over the right eye for months and months and months if you want and you will not lose vision in the eye. Additionally, healing of the eye in terms of getting it back in line is based on your body healing the eye of its own will. It has nothing to do with exercise. Um, and I'll go back to my point about vision therapy does not improve the misalignment caused by the injury to the nerve. That is just your own body healing the nerve over time. So um, did I answer your question? Okay, good. Thank you. I saw on the slide that you had injection listed. Yes. Can you explain a little more about that? Sure. Um, that was in terms of the, uh, I think I forgot to talk about it, uh, in terms of the pain. So the, the injections for pain management, for any type of facial head pain. Um, you may read about uh, Botox injections for eye misalignment. That, that doesn't work necessarily in these settings. So, so it's injections related to pain. Great, thank you. You were talking about pain uh, management, basically. Um, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, I have sh pain in my shoulder and the right side of my face and everything else and incision. We were talking to our doctor about cortisone um, is that a viable product, not a viable product? And what do you have as a suggestion to remedy to use? So um, uh, that's a sort of two-part answer. So if you have issues in the, the spinal column, um, sometimes they do cortisone injections for that. If we're not talking about that, and there's pain being triggered by, for example, like the trigeminal nerve in the face is triggering pain, what we use for that uh, is essentially nerve blocks. So it's a mix of bupivacaine and lidocaine that's injected superficially into the area of the nerve. Um, and it can also be injected uh, at the point of pain. Sometimes patients are triggered by certain areas and we can inject tailored to the patient. And that usually gives benefit for anywhere from four to six weeks. The cortisone injections, I, I do not do, um, and we don't do that for head pain, such as uh, trigeminal neuralgia or superorbital neuralgia or pain triggered by the nerves nerves of the head and face. Cortisone is more something um, that I think of as uh, management of spine or shoulder, shoulder issues. So you may, um, may employ both, depending on the specifics of your cordoma. As you can probably see, I'm your poster child, again, for the six nerve palsy. Mine has, over the past couple of years, migrated all the way over to the way you see it now. Um, I've dealt with it driving this with the double vision, but it was getting a little bit tough and at 80 miles an hour with everything coming at you this way. So with the help of my wife, I got one of those patches that just slides over it. Mm -hmm. I'm in sales, I drive 100 to 200 miles a day and just have learned to deal with it. Um, I well, back up what you said, there was not a lot of neuro ophthalmologists in the United States. I live in Pennsylvania, I go to Penn. I think there's five in Pennsylvania and three are in Philadelphia. Um, my first, I can tell you who the names are afterwards. My first doctor didn't really want to touch it. I recently in May talked to another neuro ophthalmologist who was willing to do surgery on it, to straighten it out. 
from what I understand, my optic nerve is fine. If I cover, I mean, I'm seeing over there, mm -hmm. but it's, she's saying it's all muscular damage. Um, and I want to have the surgery to straighten it. Um, they were saying 20% risk, it makes it worse or doesn't work. In your experience of doing it, how I understand it's not going to move, but at least get it straight, A, so I don't get the stares from people, especially kids, and B, so it's straight again. Um, in your experience, how successful is the, the surgery or what should be the ex expected outcome? So um, just to be clear, in our neuroophthalmology practice, uh, we do not do strabismus surgery. We have another section, um, uh, Dr. Zachary Elkin, who does strabismus surgery. Um, so I can speak in terms of uh, secondhand. Um, and uh, the, we have some patients who get the procedure for alignment, and they're great for eight, nine, 10 years with maybe a slight drift. Some patients get the surgery and within months, they're back to where they started in terms of the eye alignment. Um, I think as a patient, you know, if that's something you wanted to try, knowing that it may not work, um, you know, I think that's the, the key thing to make sure that the understanding and accepting of that is present. Even patients who do well with the surgery sometimes still need glasses with, the, with prisms. Um, and it's really a case-by-case -case, uh, evaluation. For example, Dr. Elkin would look at imaging and would also examine for the tension in the muscles um, to see if there's uh, contractures or other things that are working against aligning the eye and then would be able to give you an assessment yeah. on an individual basis. Um, so exactly like you said, it's not a slam dunk. Um, depending on how the muscles look in the setting of the chordoma, um, sometimes the muscles can be friable, in which case they would be wary of doing surgery. So it, it really would be a case-by-case -case assessment. I would say if you've had, you know, hypothetically speaking, five surgeons who don't want to touch it and one who's willing, I'd probably query the one who's willing um, because there are probably reasons the others don't want to touch it. But if you're talking about, you know, two surgeons didn't want to do anything about it and two surgeons at a different center have had experience with it and are open to trying it, then that's a different ball game you're in, right? So. Um, so I would, I would consider that because uh, some of these surgeries, you know, the eye alignment surgeries as, as a whole are done very commonly. But eye alignment surgeries, if the muscle is, uh, you know, injured or frail or scarred are probably a smaller percentage of, of strabismus surgeries being done. So if you're going to a center with experience and, and volume, and for that reason, they're comfortable proceeding, that's kind of the ball game you want to be in if you decide to move forward. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing, you mentioned the first doctor also works at CHOP, a pediatric children's hospital, Philadelphia. Hi, Dr. Pillai. Just to follow up, so after two strabismus surgeries, if the double vision hasn't changed, would the patient be um, be willing, I mean, does it, does pr do prism glasses work or half a prism or what you told us temporary? So the prisms are a physical entity that we put on or in the glasses prescription. And so what can be manufactured has, has a limit. So we measure the misalignment in prism diopters and so patients can have both a vertical misalignment and a horizontal misalignment. And you know, if the vertical and horizontal misalignments are each, for example, falling under the number 10, so you have a horizontal misalignment of six and a vertical misalignment of five, that's something that's doable in prism glasses. If you have a very large angle misalignment, 
prism glasses would not work um, just for the, the physical manufacturing of the lens. In that case, we would opt for blurring of the lens or occluding the eye, um, which are the two pictures of the, the woman with the glasses that I showed. They also make occlusion contact lenses, so somebody's getting married and they don't want these bizarre looking glasses on their wedding day. Um, this is not covered by insurance. Some insurance companies will cover it as a prosthetic device. It depends on your plan. They are contact lenses made to match the color of your eye and um, have a black dot in the center over your pupil. So it is essentially the black lens, but in a contact lens form. So, so there, are, you know, there are varying things you could do to function in business, or if you're a lawyer in front of the court and you know you want to put your special contact lens in, um, some people find that preferred. But but yeah, if it's a large angle, the deviation is really you're looking at like 20 prism diopters, 17, 18 prism diopters. Um, you're looking at occluding the eye as your solution if strabismus surgery becomes a no-go. Okay, and is that something the patient will go to you, not the, the doctor who did the strabismus surgery? For, for occluding of the lens, any optometrist can make glasses like that. So you okay. don't need to go to a neuro-ophthalmologist. You can go to any optometrist and say, I want to blur my right lens. Um, and they can, they can do it, and if they have questions about it, which sometimes they do, uh, when it's in more, you know, if they don't have experience with that, um, and I usually just talk to them on the phone and they understand what we're looking for. The contact lens is something that's ordered online. Um, okay. It does not need a prescription because in general, uh, you're, you're paying for it out of pocket. Um, but uh, yeah, so, but, uh, I am happy to advise patients on that and, you know. Okay. Okay. Thank you. No problem. My question has to do about the pituitary. You talked about one part of it, the anterior. Can you address the posterior and if you see failure in that yeah, and then no. what we should look for? Yeah, sorry, I, I didn't, didn't mention that because we almost never see posterior pituitary deficiencies after radiation. Um, so the pituitary gland has a larger anterior portion, which is approximately 80% front facing, and then a smaller portion towards the back, which is 20%, which is the posterior pituitary. So it's really the only, the only part of the pituitary that makes hormones is the anterior pituitary. The posterior pituitary just helps you store hormones that you're making from the higher center, which is the hypothalamus. So, um, you know, for those reasons, we don't quite see deficits of the posterior pituitary gland after radiation because it really doesn't quite damage that actual making mechanism, which is in the hypothalamus. As an example, as opposed to radiation, we see the posterior pituitary being affected for surgeries of the pituitary. And that's mostly because that connection between the hypothalamus, which makes the hormones of the posterior pituitary, and the posterior pituitary, that connection is lost. So that connection kind of remains intact after radiation, which is why you do not see posterior pituitary deficiencies. Uh, the main hormone that comes from the posterior pituitary is something called desmopressin. Desmopressin is a hormone that helps you keep your thirst mechanism intact. It helps you go to the bathroom in time so that you're not going frequently. So if that hormone is gone, the main symptoms are feeling very thirsty, craving salt, craving you know something very sweet, something very salty, um, and also going to the bathroom a lot to pee. So those are the main symptoms of your posterior pituitary being affected, but it almost never happens with radiation-induced hypopituitarism. I have a question of, um, that was sent in that I'm not totally sure uh, if this is the right question for you, um, Dr. Agarwal, but the um, a skull-based patient who has a, a couple, actually, that we know of who've developed diabetes. And um, is there anything that we know about as far as surgeries, radiation, even drug therapies like immunotherapies that would cause you to suddenly have uh, diabetes? 
You know, the only thing I can think of, so diabetes, by the way, I'm sure everyone knows here, but diabetes mellitus is the fact that you have high sugar, and diabetes insipidus is the one that I was describing, which is where you're missing that posterior pituitary hormone and you're going to the bathroom a lot to be feeling very thirsty. So it's completely unrelated. In fact, there was a nice consensus meeting where they're trying to rename diabetes insipidus just to avoid that confusion. So the first thing is it's absolutely two different unrelated things. I'm thinking that your question is for the sugar, so diabetes yes, mellitus, that's right. exactly. So the only things that I can think of is high-dose steroids, which we do use after some form of chordoma surgeries, um, and those can absolutely, especially if you're already borderline, something called pre-diabetes or something called impaired glucose tolerance, so if you already have that borderline predisposition, then high-dose steroids can absolutely push you towards diabetes. The good news is, is that it's reversible, so as you come down on the steroids, slash taper it down or stop it completely, those usually completely reverse unless you have more predisposing factors. So, um, yeah, so that's really the only other thing. But, you know, to, to answer your question, immunotherapy usually doesn't do it. Um, it's really the high dose steroids that can predispose you towards that. Yes, please. For the uh, posterior pituitary uh, symptoms that you're, or deficiency that you're yeah. talking about, how often? Um, do you see that persisting versus uh, resolving spontaneously, and um, does, it, does it ever uh, go on continuously, or is it, does it typically resolve spontaneously? Yeah, no, thank you. So I will answer that in context of pituitary surgery, because we really do not see it um, after radiation. So it's not quite relevant here, but I'll just quickly answer. So it usually happens approximately one to two days after any kind of pituitary surgery. And again, it has to do with that stalk being affected, the stalk which connects the hypothalamus and the pituitary. Um, it is transient in almost all cases, but it has to really do with the expertise of the surgeon. They have to make sure that they're maintaining that important structure, which is the stalk. I, at least in the NYU experience, we've only seen it as permanent diabetes insipidus in three to five percent of all cases. Sometimes that, that percentage can be even lower. But it's almost always transient, you know, just seen a couple of days after pituitary surgery. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the controversialness of the growth hormone. Yeah. Is there any um, hormone concerns with pregnancy in young adults? Specifically with growth hormone or? Just with hormones and scaldase cordoma. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's actually a great question. So um, hydrocortisone, which is the most commonly used steroid that we spoke about, uh, can be continued through pregnancy. There is a specific enzyme in the placenta, which connects the baby and the, and the mom, as you know. Uh, so that specific enzyme basically breaks down hydrocortisone so that it doesn't get into the baby system. So it's literally just treating the mom. So we can continue hydrocortisone very safely, no effect to the baby. Levothyroxine, extremely, extremely safe in pregnancy, can be continued. Hormones like the sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, we obviously want to stop that during pregnancy because you're making your own since you're pregnant. And growth hormone, even for non cordoma patients, it's not approved in pregnancy. So, you know, it's just completely out of the question. We've never used it in anyone who's pregnant. Um, just to follow up, if your body's making more home hormones because you are pregnant, is that a concern for growth of your tumor? Oh, sorry, I misunderstood. So for someone, so in terms of recurrences uh, during pregnancy, yeah, so we actually haven't seen that um, and the literature hasn't shown that either in, in pregnancy. Yeah, just because it's not estrogen driven. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you both so much. This was a wonderful session. We really appreciate all your information.